Bring 
say amen one more time. Thank Timothy for that beautiful rendition. Much appreciation. I was talking to uh, Elder Brown uh, last night and I was just kind of um, um, kind of getting some things out. Uh, nothing major. But I was just kind of griping to him uh, about uh, the fact that this series is ending um, about the Sabbath because as I continue to dig, I, I'm just noticing so much that's there. And I, I said, Elder, you know, do I need to, um, you know, just add more to, to these series um, because of everything that, that I'm finding? Um, but I, you know, I'm constantly reminded that we'll ever be learning uh, for the rest of our lives. We'll, we'll always be learning. In fact, uh, the word suggests that even when we get to heaven, uh, we'll continue to be learning about the glories of God. We'll never exhaust the glories and the learnings of God. And so, uh, be it as it may, as disappointed as I am uh, about this series ending, um, this has been a, a wonderful journey for myself, and I hope that this has been eye-opening for you. Uh, it's almost... Um, what's the word that I need? Uh, it's almost uh, almost a crazy thought uh, for Adventists to uh, have to go back and study the Sabbath. I mean, we've been studying the Sabbath <laughs> for uh, literally uh, almost 200 years now. Uh, but there's always so much that we can learn about the Sabbath day. What do you say? Um, and as I said from the outset, I, I started off this series saying that uh, I would not be doing a sermon series trying to prove to you that the seventh day is the Sabbath. I'm, I'm, I'm not there. That, that's not where I am. Um, I'm trying to take us way beyond that because if we're trying to prove, uh, you know, a doctrinal point or a doctrinal statement, we'll, we'll never grow in our understanding of the Sabbath. So I hope my, my, my goal has been uh, reached by the end of today that we will grow in the understanding of the beauty of the Sabbath. Uh, because it is indeed a beautiful thing. Who says amen? With that said, with that said, um, I invite us to uh, read our, our scripture reading today. As a matter of fact, there are there are two. Uh, if you don't mind, um, I had to squeeze something Christmassy in here as I uh, did the Sabbath. You'll understand by the end of my message why I do this. But I invite you to read this with me. This is Hebrews chapter four. Uh, verses 1 through 11, and then uh, at the end of that, we'll skip over to Matthew chapter 1, and just a verse and a half in Matthew chapter 1. But read this with me uh, today. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear 
lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is God speaking. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4, it says, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Now we're going to skip over to Matthew chapter 1 and just a verse and a half. Let's read this together. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Bow your heads with me this afternoon as we look at the topic, This is Only a Test, Part 2. Heavenly Father, God, we need a revelation from you. Lord, in a world full of anxiety, in a world full of restlessness, Lord, we need some lessons about what rest is all about. And in the ultimate sense, Lord God, we're asking that you will come soon so that rest can be a part of our everyday experience. Not just a weekly experience, Lord, but we want to rest in you every single day. We want to worship you every day. We want to have an everyday Sabbath experience, Lord God, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Do that for us starting today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last time I stood here, two weeks ago, behind this desk, we took a look at Exodus chapter 16 and how God provided manna for the children of Israel in the wilderness after they were freed from their 400 plus year enslavement in Egypt. And we concluded that having been enslaved for so long, there were some generational practices and worldviews that God had to correct. And after 400 years of being enslaved, that took a long time to correct. See, in Egypt, they had been accustomed to a 24-7 work schedule. And when God wanted to bless them with a 24-6 work schedule, that the Israelites, the word says, that they longed to go back to the old ways of slavery. Pharaoh had so penetrated their minds with work that when Moses requested for the people to leave Egypt in order to worship God, the word says that Pharaoh ridiculed the concept of the Sabbath and ordered them to work even more to drown out any possibility of rest. And our point was that we, that overwork is the antithesis of Sabbath rest and that far from being a burden, as many times, you know, many times we, we look at the Sabbath a, a, as a burden. Oh, man, I, I've got I've to give God a day. No, no, but far from being a burden, God designed the Sabbath to be a gift from the tyranny of work. The six-day-a-week gift of manna was a foretaste of the possibilities of God's provision in the promised land of Canaan. If you remember that from two weeks ago, say amen. 
Our text in Hebrews for today fast forwards 40 plus years after that manna, when the manna finally began, that, that, that first manna experience, to when the Israelites finally enter the promised land. Moses is dead and Joshua is now their leader. God had rained down manna from heaven six days a week, every week for those 40 years. When they finally entered the land of promise, the Bible says that the manna stopped all of a sudden. But the promised land was supposed to be the, 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 the culmination of what the manna had pointed towards. No longer did they have to pick up bread off of the ground in a land that flowed with milk and honey. The manna should have prepared them to trust in the Lord, knowing that even when they do not work one day out of the seven days, that he would provide even more for them than if they had worked all seven days of the week. Not only did God give the command, but he gave them the rationale for the Sabbath. We find this in Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. This is the rationale. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. Of course, that's the command. Here's the rationale. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation. Sign of what, Lord? Where well, here's a sign. That you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That you may know that I am the Lord that takes care of you. I am the one that though you rest one day of the week, that I will rain down blessings upon blessings. This was God's ideal. But when they entered the promised land, the things that God had done for them was forgotten. And because the Sabbath was forgotten, when the Sabbath, uh, what, excuse me, what, 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 what the Sabbath signified was forgotten also. Because the Sabbath was forgotten, what the Sabbath signified was forgotten also. This was Ezekiel's point by the time we get there. In Ezekiel chapter 20, here's what he said. He said, so I, I also raised my hand in an oath to them, this is God speaking, in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey. That's the Canaan land. The glory of all lands. Why? Verse 16 because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes but profaned my Sabbaths. For their heart went after their idols. Now I'm going to come back there and I, I just want to give us a word of hope because God, you know, we, God isn't this condemning God that, that many of us think that, that, that he is uh, because he, he goes to a positive. He said, verse 17, nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. Yes, they despised my commands. Uh, yes, they despised my judgments. Yes, they did not walk in my statutes. Yes, they profaned my Sabbaths. But my eyes spared them from destruction. I did not want to make an end of them in the wilderness. I love them. But, 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 but back to what, what, what God is talking about. They, they profane my Sabbath for their heart went after their idols. See, the, the Sabbath was never just about physical rest. Even though physical rest is part of it, of course. We, 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 we've got to physically rest on the Sabbath. Physical rest is a part of Sabbath keeping, but it was never just about physical rest. The Sabbath was especially about spiritual rest. See, notice that Ezekiel connects the Israelites' breaking of the Sabbath to them eventually worshiping idols. And the only reason, hear this, to worship an idol is because you believe that the idol can do something for you that God cannot do for you. That's the only right, that's the only reason to worship an idol because you think that this can give you something or bless you with something that God isn't willing to give you. And, 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 and they, they, they believe, they believe that, 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 that the 
these idols could do something for them. You expect the idol to give you peace of mind instead of God giving you peace of mind. You expect the idol to give you spiritual rest. And by the way, by spiritual rest, I mean rest of the heart, rest of the soul, rest of the mind. Uh, you expect the idol to give you spiritual rest. They expected spiritual rest from, their, from them worshiping idols. But the only true rest comes from worshiping the Lord and not idols. Amen. And so what was happening is that they were worshiping the idols, but they were still stressed. Worshiping the idols, but still having anxiety. Worshiping the idols and still vexed in their spirit. Worshiping the idols and working seven days a week instead of six. Because only God can produce more blessings in less days. No idol can ever do that. The, the bottom line is that, is that at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness, the, the Israelites still had not learned to trust God. This is exactly what Ezekiel is saying, or God is saying in Ezekiel. Look, I gave you my Sabbath. I, I took you to the, to, to the, to the promised land, but, but you're not getting the lesson. I fed you. Every single day, uh, even though you didn't have to go out on the seventh day to pick up the manna, but you still ate on the seventh day. I did that for you. You could have never done that yourself. I did that, but you still profane my Sabbath. And so, and so uh, they, they still hadn't learned to trust God. And as a result, God said, and this is in our scripture reading, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, that they shall not enter my rest. Now, I need, you to, I need you to notice something here. Notice the language that God uses, right? The book of Hebrews doesn't say that they shall not enter my land. They, they entered the promised land. God didn't say, no, you can't enter my land. No, it says they shall not enter my land rest. In, in other words, it's not that the land is not the land that was God's primary concern. It was his rest that was his primary concern. See the people and it, this is just a function of, of humanity if we're not careful, the people were so focused on the blessing of the land that they missed the most important blessing which was the rest. And literally, get this now, uh, this is still the issue that they're fighting over in the Middle East. There's political unrest over the land. Religious unrest over the land. And the, throughout the history of, of, of the Israelites, there was always this thing about the land, the land, the land, the land, but missing the most important portion of Sabbath rest. And it wasn't just about the land, it was about entering God's rest. And the Israelites ended up entering the promised land, but they failed to arrive at the promised destination. The land was never their, their, their true destination. And just like the illustration of my, in, in the first message of this series, we, we talked about uh, the manna or, or, or about the, the, the Sabbath uh, functioning as sort, of a, um, as sort of the Ellis Island or the Statue of Liberty as, as immigrants were coming into America. They, they sailed into this port. Uh, and, and stopped at Ellis Island. And, of course, the destination was never Ellis Island. No one lived on Ellis Island. This was just the Statue of Liberty was just the, 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 the sign of great things to come. And so when they were on the boat, everyone got excited. When they came through the, when, when, when they saw through the fog, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty shining bright in all of her majesty. Folk got excited, not because their destination was the, was the Statue of Liberty, but because this was just a symbol of their true uh, 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 of, of great things to come who's with me right and, and so the, the 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 sabbath was this uh was this symbol of the promised land the promised land wasn't just about the land that they entered 40 years after the wilderness wanderings the scripture essentially says that they entered the land but did not enter his rest. And so the whole time they look forward to the blessing of the promised land, but the Sabbath really pointed to something much more than the land. 
See, when, when people immigrated to America, and this still happens today, people immigrate to America from, from, from other countries for, for whatever reason they, they immigrate uh, for, America was probably better than where they came from in most cases, in many cases, right? People have been fleeing famine or civil persecution or religious persecution or all kinds of things. America had the ideal values that they were seeking. But when they got here, hear me very closely, as much as America was preferable than where they came from, America still had people problems. So they, they, they got here and discovered that, that, that humans are humans anywhere on earth. Come on and say amen, somebody. Different place, same problems. Uh, they, they were prejudiced in, the, in their country where they came from. They got persecuted where they come. Well, we're prejudiced in America too. Come on and say amen, right? Uh, we're judgmental in America too. We're money hungry in, in America too. We're stressed in America too. And it might be preferable to other countries, but if we tell the truth today, America ain't Everything is cracked up to be. And when they finally got there, after their 40-year journey in the wilderness, the Israelites discovered that the promised land wasn't everything it was cracked up to be because they still had human problems. That's why the book of Hebrews says, Hebrews 11 verse 16, here's what it says. It says, but as it is, they desire a better country. What kind of country are they desiring? A heavenly one. See, look, this promised land thing, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it was well and nice. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. They had big, uh, big fruit. Remember when the, when the, when the, when the uh, spies went out, they came back holding bunches of grapes that took two men to hold, and they took it back. They said, look, look, look at all the provision here. But in reality, it's still a worldly or human world on this planet. No matter where you go, you can move from the hood to the White House. You're still living in a human planet. Right? And the, the people of faith, the Bible says, and this is the, the faith chapter of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, it says, yeah, 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 they, they, they were looking for the promised land. But they desired a land that was better than any land here on earth. What kind of land was that? It was a heavenly one. It also describes Abraham's journey like this. This is Hebrews chapter 11 also. It says, by faith. Read this with me. When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, uh, even though he did not know where he was going. Verse 9. By faith he made his home in where? promised land like a stranger in a foreign country for he was looking forward to the city with foundations was this an earthly city no this is a city whose architect and builder is God it, it, it wasn't a an earthly city or country or nation that people of faith were looking for that's not what it is and the Sabbath get this I'm about to connect the dots in just a second the Sabbath is all about the experience of heaven. That's what the Sabbath is all about. They were looking for a country, a heavenly country. Abraham was looking for a city, not one with foundations like we have it, but the, 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 a city whose architect and builder is God himself. That's what the Sabbath is all about. That's why Isaiah could write, Isaiah chapter 66, he says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, meaning every month, uh, every day of the month, and from one Sabbath to another, meaning from uh, every single day of the week, all flesh shall come to worship before me. And this is a vision of what heaven is going to be all about. Isaiah is saying that every single day will be a Sabbath day. And instead of coming here just once a week on the Sabbath day to worship God, every single day will be a Sabbath that we will worship before God our Savior. In the grand scheme of things, the land was never the real destination for the Israelites. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8 says that, For if Joshua had given them rest, 
God would not speak later about another day. Joshua gave them rest. They, they received rest from, from their travels, rest from, from the Egyptians. But God still spoke of another rest there. And it tells us that the journey that began when Israel left Egypt is actually still waiting for its completion. The journey did not end when they got to the Canaan land. Israel never truly arrived at the experience to which God wanted to lead them. It was never about the land. It was about the experience. And it tells us that rest is not just a day. The Sabbath isn't just a day. The Sabbath isn't just about the promised land in the grand scheme of things. The Sabbath, Sabbath rest is an experience sabbath rest in fact is a person i'm going to show you why i say that in just a second it's not about a day it's not about the land it's not about the blessings it's not just about physical rest sabbath rest is an experience it is a person and this leads us to the birth of Jesus Christ. See, as the story of Jesus commences in the book of Matthew, the gospel writer begins with the genealogy of the Messiah, right? Genealogy, you know, you know what a genealogy is. This person begat that person, that person begat this person, Abraham begat uh, Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and so on and so forth. And it started with Abraham, and it got all the way down to Jesus, uh, this person. Was, and so that's what a genealogy is. And, and the birth story, we, we, when we experience Christmas, uh, before we actually get to the birth story, a part of the birth story is the genealogy of Jesus. And as the genealogy is concluding in the book of Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus, I see, Matthew describes the number of generations that it took to get from Abraham to Jesus. And then many times in genealogies, when we're reading the word, we just kind of skip down to the end. But, you know, there, there are some important facts in genealogies. Here it is. Here it is. Here's what the Bible says. Verse 17. Read this with me. It says, so all the generations from who to were how many? Okay. And from to uh -huh. How many generations? And from the deportation to, uh, to who? To Christ, how many generations? Okay, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Now, stick with me. Here it is. I'm, I'm ending in just a second. I'm just a few minutes today. Matthew describes the generations as three sets of 14 generations. Are you with me so far? All right. 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the deportation when they uh, were exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem, and then another 14 generations from the exile uh, to when the Messiah was born. All right, we get that. Uh, and so, uh, I, and I'd like to look, instead of looking at it as three sets of 14 generations, get this, play with the numbers just a little bit, and look at it as six sets of seven generations. Are you with me, everybody? All right, we had 14, three sets of 14, but three times 14 is the same thing as six times seven. Are you with me? Okay, all right. Now, now, get, j j j j j just go with me uh, it, because it reminds me of another text in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25. Here it is. Let, read this with me, and this might be the last one, I think. Here it is. It says, and you shall count seven of years, meaning seven sevens of years, for yourself, seven times what? Okay, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you how many years? Okay, seven times seven equals 49. We get that. All right, verse nine. Then you shall do what? Cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. Verse 10, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants all right now stick with me here we go uh we learned a couple of weeks ago that every seven years the farmer and we, they lived in an agrarian society most people were farmers at that time farmers were supposed to leave the land alone and not sow any seeds why to give the ground 
a chance to replenish its nutrients. And so the seventh year represented rest. If you're with me, say amen. All right. Now, we're told in Leviticus chapter 25 that the last year of the seventh period of seven years, the 49th year, was to be a jubilee year. All right. Seven, six years you plant, seventh year you don't. Another six years you plant, seventh year you don't. You do that seven times in all, but then it says, on the seventh of the seven years, do not plant at all, but in fact, that seventh period of seven years is going to be a very special jubilee. In that year, all the slaves were to be freed and all debts were to be forgiven. All the land and all the people were to have rest from their weariness and from their burdens. The seventh seven, the Sabbath of Sabbaths, was a foretaste of the final rest that all, that all of us will have when God renews the earth in glory. What does this have to do with the birth of Jesus? This means that when Jesus was born, he began the generation of the seventh seven. It says 14 generations, 14, 14. Six generations of seven lined up before Jesus, and Jesus, when he was born, began the seventh seven of generations, meaning that Jesus is the ultimate source of the ultimate example of what rest is all about. When Jesus was born, it means that he brought all of the Sabbath rest that he had designed for humanity and gave us rest from our sins, rest from our anxiety, rest from every single thing that has us wound up. He gives us rest when he's born. Jesus is the Sabbath generation. Jesus is the culmination, the destination, and the goal of what the Sabbath rest is all about. True rest only comes through Jesus Christ. And many times, people of God, I, I, I believe, I believe that we have missed, we have missed, we have missed the true goal of what the Sabbath is all about right? The Sabbath, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't meant for us to, 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 to rejoice in ourselves or to say that we're right and they're wrong. It was, it was never about that. Never. It was always about, hey, I will give you rest. Will you rest in me? That's what it was always about. I, I will handle things for you. I will do it for you. Okay, here's manna six days a week. On the seventh day, I will provide for you. It was never about physical rest. Sabbath was always about spiritual rest. And it's the, the experience that we have when we have faith in Jesus Christ. When you have inward peace, you have rest. Your mind is at rest. Your, your soul is at rest. And believe it or not, that inward peace that Jesus gives you, it gives us physical rest as well. Your body begins to rest. When you're, when you're not so wound up about trying to control your own life, you can rest assured that Jesus has your back. And I'm confident today, and I'm talking to some Adventists in this house today, that many of us, have experienced physical rest. And yes, that, that, that's a part of it. Very important part. I, 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 I praise God that the end of a, at the end of the long week, I, you know, I, I can have some physical rest. Praise the Lord. Come on and say amen. Right? But physical rest was never the true goal of what the Sabbath was all about. And many of us here on Sabbath morning are resting from work, but our souls are still bound. We, we, yeah, yeah, we, we, we rest physically, but spiritually, that inner peace that Jesus gives us, we're still wrestling. Still wrestling. 
That's what the Sabbath is all about. That spiritual rest that Jesus gives us right here. And if you have been experiencing right day rest, but not Jesus rest, you haven't experienced the Sabbath. If you've been experiencing physical rest because you don't work on this day, praise God. I, I praise the Lord that, you know, he's brought you this far. Amen. But you haven't experienced the rest that is found in Jesus Christ. Then you've missed the true destination of what the Sabbath was all about. So I invite you, I invite you, Sabbath keeping folk. Letter of the law folk, praise the Lord for the law. But I'm inviting folk that know about the letter of the law. But it failed to miss the true destination. And that's the experience of Jesus Christ on his day. On his day. And I, I'll admit, I'll admit that many times growing up in this thing, I've missed the mark. I've missed it. So focused on this and that aspect. That, you know, being right. Look, it was never about being right. This was about being in Jesus Christ, being within Jesus. So I invite you, I invite you to look at the lens of the Sabbath through Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that gives us rest. If you're willing to do that as Sabbath-keeping people, to be in true rest with Jesus, I invite you to stand right now with Jesus. You're resting in what he has done for you. You're resting in the promised land that he has prepared for you. You're resting because he has prepared a place, a better country for you. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, Lord, at times we've missed the mark. At times, Lord God, we've seen one aspect of the Sabbath and it's been very limiting for us, Lord. We've seen, Lord, that you've given us a day, seventh day, Lord. We've been content with just coming in here on the Sabbath, being technical, being right, but not rested. So, Lord, we claim the rest that you have for our souls right now. The rest that you have for our spirits, Lord God. Lord, we want to enter into your rest. Not the rest of a land. Not the rest of Canaan. Not the rest of a day, per se. Not the rest, not the blessings that you have because we keep this. And we believe in all those things, Lord God. But we believe that the greatest blessing that we could ever experience on the Sabbath day is just being in your presence. It's just experience, experiencing time with you we ask for forgiveness lord that if we have experienced the seventh day but haven't experienced a life-changing relationship with you on this day lord god so change our perspective of sabbath from being just every seven days lord to sabbath being every single day that I am in the presence of Jesus is a restful, restful day. Lord, we long for that time when we'll see you every single day. We'll look in your face. That day when every day will be Sabbath and we'll worship you every day. Not in a church, not in a temple, not in a synagogue. For your word says that there's no temple there, Lord. Because your lamb, your presence is there every day. And we'll see you and worship you. We're looking forward to that time. Hasten your coming even now. So that Sabbath will have no end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen.